Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here. And tonight we're going to introduce a band that at one point in history were thought to be secretly the Beatles. Now with this band, it's interesting. Many, even casual Beatle fans are not familiar with this band. And yet I would bet that most of you have heard their material. But first, a great big thank you to all of you viewers. Your response to my videos have been absolutely amazing. And I'm talking about the comments, folks. The thumbs ups are always appreciated. And thank you so much for such a positive response in that area. But you know what? For you new viewers, this channel is a tribe. You know, when I suggest that you hit that subscribe to the tribe button and then hit that top bell notification so that you'll be notified of all my future videos, it's much more than just a channel slogan. I get hundreds of comments just on an average video and the videos that seem to go a bit viral, especially for the size of my small channel, I get thousands. This was my whole point in establishing this channel right from the very start. And that, of course, was to create a channel where we, as an actual tribe, whether we agree with each other or not, can come to some sort of consensus in the comments. And so many of you have joined in on that discussion. You know, my last video was a bit controversial, and guess what? I lost subscribers because of it. But you know, I'm not worried about that. If folks are subscribing to the channel because they think it's a narrowly focused channel, they're going to be disappointed. And besides, being a tribal member is not for the faint-hearted. All right, so let's get back to this mysterious band that back in 1976, when I first heard them, I had heard they might just very well be the Beatles who secretly recorded this album so that they would not get any publicity. But you know, I'm not covering this band just because they are a footnote, a curiosity in the history of rock and roll. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I'd like you guys to all keep this in mind. Did this band, more than just being a Beatle-influenced band, point the way to the police? All right, so back to 1976, the release of 347 EST, standing for Eastern Standard Time. The band is, of course, Klaatu, a name and a reference from the movie the day the earth stood still. The three members of this band, now that's interesting, there were only three members to this band, were heavy science fiction fans, haha, <laughs> to my heart, and that was one of their favorite movies, and so that's where they adapted the band name Klaatu, from the phrase Klaatu Barada Nikto. What does that mean? Well, look it up, we gotta get down to Klaatu brass tacks here. Now it's interesting, before we actually get to the albums and the output of this band, I'd like to bring out that, you know, the Beatles, when they released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the prime work for psychedelic rock, by the way, they established, if not actually invented, that entire genre of rock. Now, a lot of people break up the Beatles in time zones, don't they? There's early Beatles, there's mid Beatles, there's late Beatles, and some people add in between mid Beatles and late Beatles, the psychedelic Beatles. Of course, their music from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and Magical Mystery Tour, and a couple of tracks from Yellow Submarine, if you can call that an album, established a whole sub-genre. Now, there have been bands that have delved into this sub-genre in modern times. Hell, there's even psychedelic jazz out there now. But you know what? To me, good psychedelic music, whether jazz or right to the pop expression that the Beatles gave us, is a wonderful area to explore musically. And I've always wondered 
why bands haven't done even more of that. You know, true, there have been bands like Oasis who have delved into that very uh, psychedelic period of the Beatles. And Oasis is one of those bands like the Rolling Stones, I have a love-hate relationship. More on them in a future episode. But you know, with the release of Clap 2's very first album, 347 Eastern Standard Time, we were introduced to the very best band who fully explored this psychedelic subgenre of rock. And yes, they did do it in Beatle fashion. You see, they were Beatle fans like me and a lot of their songwriting was influenced by the Beatles. They were very melody-centric and harmony-centric, just like the Beatles, and even, at times, like the Beatles, imitating Beach Boy backing vocals. Wonderful. Now, over the years, this band has been historically pigeonholed as more of a curiosity in a sliver of time, but you know, I couldn't disagree more. I think Klaatu from Canada is one of the major bands in rock and roll history, if you ask me. Now, how exactly the word got out that these guys were the Beatles is a bit mysterious, but uh, the band did not like that press. They wanted to be judged on the music that they had produced. They were open about being Beatles fans. They were open about the Beatles being a source of inspiration for them. And thank God they were. Now, as I said, the band comprised of three members, John Wollaschuk, D. Long, and Terry Draper. All three were songwriters, although Willis Chuck and Long wrote most of the material. Now, at the beginning of the video, if you remember, I said that even if you have never heard of this band, you've probably heard them in a sense. And by that, I mean it was Karen Carpenter that heard the very first track off of their very first album, Calling Occupants, of interplanetary craft. It was a big hit for them, wasn't it? So you see, you've already heard the flavor of some of their music. You know, as good a job as the Carpenters did on that single, it took away the validity of that song somehow for me. I was always a Karen Carpenter fan up to the point that they took her off the drums and then they really didn't have a whole lot to say to me as a music fan from that point on. You can't deny Karen Carpenter had a wonderful voice. But this is the song that kicks off their first album. With further highlights like Sub Rosa Subway, you could swear Paul was singing right into your ear on that one. Even with Paul McCartney bass lines, wonderful bass playing, and I believe that it was John Willis Chuck that usually took over the bass parts and keyboards. And then there's California Jam. This song takes on Edgar Cayce's prophecies of California slipping into the ocean. Now, have you ever thought how that would actually look? A whole state slipping into the ocean? But you know, when you listen to Clat 2 sing about this, they bring a whimsy to it. And all I can say is, Goodbye, mythical Malibu. Obviously, you hear Harrison influences in the song Dr. Marvello. You know, from the almost whimsy of the track Sir Rugglesby on this album to the ultra weird anus of Uranus. This album is a classic rock album, folks. This album is historical. Now, in 1977, the band released their second album and they had already had it with them being compared to the Beatles. John Wollaschuk rose as the prime writer on many of the tracks on this album, and it was a concept album, and it's entitled Hope. Even employing the London Symphony Orchestra, John Wollaschuk wanted to make a statement here. Now, the actual tale is about a planet that reached a point of destruction because of their own hubris. You know, and it, it's that brilliant story idea really raises some questions that we can take a look at right here on planet Earth, even in 2022. The album starts off with the wonderful We're Off You Know, along with the crazy Madman. Right away with these two tracks, you know this album is going in a different direction. 
not only does it have that concept feel, but it has a grandness to it, guys. And it's not just because of the London Symphony Orchestra. And you know, this album is every bit the artistic statement that Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd is in my book. The next track, Around the Universe in 80 Days, gets very dark at times and yet has a whimsy to it. And the final track on side one, Politzania. Now, that's not an important track other than it adding flavor to the whole concept, but it's the way they sing the word Politzania. You hear them sing the first initial drawn out, almost like they're singing Paul. This, I'm sure, was a snipe at their critics. And good for you, Klaatu. The highlights on side two are The Loneliest of Creatures, So Said, The Lighthouse Keeper, and the classic title song from this album, Hope. We move forward one year, 1978, and they release their third album, Sir Army Suit. Remember those days, folks, when bands actually released an album every year? Now, Dee and Terry, evidently, in the band had gotten a bit upset with John Wallace-Chuck getting so much cover time on the last album. Uh, the band started relying on all three members more heavily, and of course, Dee Long, shines on this album. Not that Wallace Chuck doesn't. You know, I think it's this album that is the most accessible album that Clat 2 ever put out. Their songwriting is on a level, just as songwriters here. Well, they're on Beatle level here, folks. A Routine Day, wonderful song. There's a famous video of that. Take a look at that here on YouTube. You can access that. Side One continues with, and I think this was actually a single at one time, Everybody Took a Holiday, The Dark, Older, and of course, the wonderful love song, Dear Christine. But you know, the band never totally ignored their psychedelic roots, and it's on side two where we really see some great psychedelic tracks. It starts off with the very political Mr. Manson, and then is followed by the wonderfully quirky Toki Moore Fields and Perpetual Motion Machine. Of course, that's followed by the very French sounding Cherry, and then the last track on the album, Silly Boys. All I can say, get this album in its physical form, get the lyrics, and then get your mirror ready. Now you can tell by that album, the band was really trying to refocus itself on its pop structures. And it sold well, but not as well as their record company thought it should. So their record company made some decisions for the band, and it's the next album that many fans would probably choose as their least favorite album. I'm not sure that I would. Uh, there is some brilliant stuff, and I play this album all the time. And of course, I'm talking about their 1980 release. This time, two years, in between releases, and I think that was because of some record company shenanigans as well. And of course, I'm talking about their album, Endangered Species. Now, many Klaatu fans choose this as their least favorite album, and it is probably the band's least favorite album, and there's a very good reason for that. You see, when they went in, they were given a producer that they had to work with, and only John Wallace-Chuck was really given kind of studio reigns with D. Long and Terry Draper often not even being utilized. I can't believe that D. Long especially could, would not be utilized as a guitarist, but they were trying to update their sound to this new 80s sound, and it wasn't a good mix for the band and the company. But despite all of that, this is still a wonderful album. It's always in the song, folks, and this album is great. You know, the, it's the very first track. I can't help it. You know you're listening to Klaatu, and it's one of the best songs they ever recorded. Knee Deep in Love follows that track. Absolutely classic Klaatu. With tracks set the world on fire and sell out, sell out, you can hear the disgruntled nature of this album, obviously. But you know what? This album has the very best boy werewolf meets girl vampire song ever created in the history of music. And it's of course called 
Howl at the Moon. With this song, they even implore tango beats to really accentuate this wonderful story. This one song, folks, this is a movie waiting to happen. This is an entire movie that needs to be made. Well, you know, by the time 1981 rolled around, the band had had it. You know, the business end of the music industry never gave this band its chance. But 1981, the three of them one more time got together and put out their final album. And of course, I'm talking about Magenta Lane. Now with Magenta Lane, the band clearly goes back and they've talked about in interviews, they just went right back to the basics. And the basics are somewhere in between that sound that they had with 347 EST and that sound they had achieved on Sir Army's suit. And it sits almost right in the middle stylistically. There is a style. First of all, I've already expressed the importance that rock and roll really needs to re-embrace psychedelia in general. I really believe that psychedelia has not been fully explored and any new rock bands out there willing to do this, are you listening Greta Van Fleet? What they could accomplish would catch the world by surprise just like Sgt. Pepper did in 1967. So I see this band as a valid major rock band just for that reason alone. You know, it was their first album. It was made over a couple of years. They put together these tracks when they could find the time and afford the studio time. And they stayed true to their nature. They stayed true to their own quirky sense of humor. After all, they gave us the continuous mouse squeak here and there. All right, so that's about it for the video tonight. I want to thank you for watching. My name is Michael Nolan. This is The Bottom Line. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm uh, better identify the channel. The videos become more searchable and the channel grows as a result. Thank you. All right, so like I said before, I'm Michael Nolan. This is The Bottom Line, and I'll see you in my next video. Thank you.